I've worked 200 homicides in my 35 years. And you can never prepare for something like this. We were dealing with everything. We were dealing with drugs. We were dealing with murder. We were dealing with kidnapping. We were dealing with the unbelievable. We were dealing with people that believed in human sacrifices. We were dealing with people that, that had, to me, just had no heart. In 89, when spring break would come around, kids would come from all the universities and they'd come down here and party. And why would they come down here to party? Because we had Matamors. Matamors and Brownsville are, are just right next to each other. The only thing that divides our downtowns or our cities is the river. And why would they come down to Matamors? Because you could drink at the age of 16. This case of the missing college student I'm going to call him John. Started one morning, sitting on my desk. My secretary called me and told me there was a couple of kids that wanted to talk to me about a kid being missing in Matamoros. So I brought the boys into my office and I started talking to them and they gave me a little background on John. They were partying in Matamoros right across the border. They were drinking there. They decided to leave. They were walking down toward the bridge, heading back home. And of course, the reason they walked back toward the bridge is because when when they come from the island, they park their car on the United States and they walk across to go to Mexico and party. So they're walking back to walk across the bridge to come back and pick up their cars. As they were walking across, uh, John kind of backed off a little bit and went into some trees. There's a little park area as they're walking across on the side because he had to use the bathroom. So the other kids kept walking. They made it across the bridge. They went through customs and everything and got to the car. And they looked around, and, and John wasn't there. So they started looking for John. And they said, well, he'll be here in a minute. So they waited, and they waited, and they, wa they waited a couple of hours. And John never made it across. 48 hours go by, nothing. I mean, not a trace of John, not a trace of John. And my problem was this. All my witnesses are going to leave in three days because they're all going back home. So I need to get John's picture on TV, on our newspapers, and get flyers because if anybody saw him, it's going to be these kids right now. I had worked with the Mexican police for 20 years up to this time. Best cooperation you've ever had in your life. All of a sudden, I ran into a wall. No cooperation. The state police commander was telling us, that John was involved in narcotics, but they wouldn't tell me where they're getting the information. This guy was corrupt. What we're dealing with right here on the border, one day you're investigating the crime in Brownsville, Texas, and tomorrow morning you're investigating it in Matamoros, Mexico, not your jurisdiction, and you have to know how to move around. And you can't step on the wrong toes because you know they're gonna kick you out of the country. But we were lucky. What helped us in this investigation was I had been working and we had been working some narcotic cases. DEA Brownsville had been working real close with a comandante in Matamoros. That comandante was Juan Benitez Ayala. He was the head of the federal police assigned to the Matamoros area. This man Juan Benitez Ayala was, I'd say, about five foot tall. But he probably stood about eight foot tall. I mean, when this guy walked in anywhere, people were scared of him. He worked, and that's all he did. You, don't, you didn't see him in bars. You didn't see him in restaurants. And the reason there, he wouldn't go to bars or restaurants, one, he was afraid somebody might put something in his drink and kill him. The guy was taking down some powerful people in Mexico. And we went to talk to him. And I told him, look, we got this problem with the state police guy. He says these kids were involved in narcotics and this, and, and you know, and I, and I assure you they weren't. And 
we had helped him on some cases. He had busted some big people because we had shared this information with him. So he put his people to work. And every time we had a lead, we call him, we go over there, we go kick doors down, you know, over there you don't need a search warrant. You know, the search warrant is the federal police. Nobody gets in your way. We started getting a lot of tips, little things. We checked them out, nothing. We checked out something else, nothing. We already had pumped as much as we could to the media. We already had up the reward. I think we were up to about $20,000. You know, we were running out of things to keep it alive. So I went to the Comandante's office. As I walked in, I looked over and there was a guy standing right there. And he says, ¿Qué pasó, Gabito? And I look at him and I say, What are you doing here, Serafín? Serafín Hernández had been arrested and he was standing right there. And the Comandante says, You know this guy? I said, Yeah, I dealt with him back a few months ago where his uncle was kidnapped in Brownsville for narcotics. And this guy came to me because he wanted us to help him. He had been kidnapped in Brownsville. So Benitez starts talking about Serafín Hernández. The Federales had a roadblock on the highway, and he didn't stop on the roadblock. He drove right through it with the Comandante, followed him to the ranch. They had stopped him and arrested him. And searching the ranch, they had found 250 pounds of marijuana. But he had seen this little hut there. So they had opened the door of this hut, and it had all this, he used the word brujería, witchcraft inside and he kind of described a bunch of candles and bottles of some kind of a whiskey and he said there was this big pot in the middle and he was going to check into that because it was kind of weird so we all went back to work and that's where that stayed about two o'clock in the morning i received a phone call gavito see ¿Sí? comandante juan benitez ayala he's calling me I said, mi comandante, you know, ¿qué pasa? What's happening? He says, uh, we found John. I said, you found John? Are you kidding? He said, no, we found John. I said, where? He said, he's buried in a ranch outside of Matamoros. But I asked him, how or who? When he arrested Serafín, there was a caretaker that also lived there at the ranch. When he arrested Serafin, he picked him up too, the caretaker, but he didn't file charges against them. But he kept them like under house arrest. And the caretaker saw a picture of John on top of the table. And he pointed to it and he says, I know that boy. How do you know? I was feeding him. I was giving him bread. I untied one of his arms so he could sit up and eat because they had him tied in the back of a suburban. They call the commandant, he comes over, he says, well, get Serafín Hernández out here. So they get him out of the cell and they bring him out. And the commandant was ready to do whatever he needed to do, you know, probably torture this guy or something to get the truth out of him. And uh, he showed him a picture, he says, do you know this guy? And he says, yes. He said, that's, that's John, the guy that everybody's looking for. How do you know him? He says, because I was the one that kidnapped him. Where is he? He's buried out at the ranch. What ranch? Where, where you got the, the marijuana? I mean, this guy was volunteering all this information. Usually in Mexico, you have to go, you know, I, I guess it's it's a, it's something that you know when you get arrested that they're going to torture you to get the truth out of you. But I've never heard of anybody just confessing this easily as Serafín did. And we kind of talked a little bit and the name Constanzo had come up on his investigation. Serafín had said that they had kidnapped John because the padrino, Constanzo, wanted somebody that was studying medicine because they were doing some kind of a witchcraft, that they were going to use John's brain to give it to this pot that they had. And I didn't understand what he was talking about. And I said, well, did you have to torture this guy? He said, no, I mean, this guy thinks that 
that bullets do him no harm, that police can't hurt him. He thinks that this guy, whatever his name's, that name is, Constanzo, is going to come in here and take him out of here. So that ended the conversation there. And, uh, of course, I called everybody involved, and we went out and met the Comandante in the morning, and everybody headed out to this ranch. And we got there, and they had set a feet with them. And they asked him, where's the body? And he says, which body? Just like that, which body? Man, the Comandante says, man, if you're playing games with me. And he got pissed off. Serafine says, hold on. I want to know which body you want. What do you mean, which body? Which body? I mean, there's a bunch of bodies out here. Isn't that just one body? Which body do you want? Just like that. And I come and say, what do you mean? Yeah, there's some buried. And he started walking through the, through the corrals of the ranch. He said, there's one buried here, and there's one buried here, and one buried here. Yeah, it's the road. Gilberto, Gilberto, ¿qué? No, lo, no sé el apellido. ¿Y de este lado? No, no sé, señor. Acá aquí de este lado, no sé tampoco. Pero si ayudaste tú, ¿manda? Ayudaste. Sí, señor. How many? Oh, I don't know. And then the comandante, God almighty, what's going on here? He says, and where's John? So he went over there and he started looking for John and he says, where that wire is right there. And he says, what wire? That coat hanger that's sticking out. And there was a coat hanger sticking out. Why is there a coat hanger? Oh, because uh, Constanzo wanted to make a necklace with the John's backbone. So after we, we, uh, we killed him and everything, we ran a wire through the back, through his spinal cord, all the way and come out. So later on, we just can come and get it out and he can make a necklace. Telling us, just the way I'm telling you, I mean, no fear whatsoever, no nothing. You could tell this guy was flying high and not on drugs in belief. He was a believer. This guy thought that he had no problem and that just like this, he was going to be released at any time. So we start digging up the bodies. We put Serafine to dig up John. And uh, during this time, Serafine started telling us why they were killing people because they were worshiping. And, he kind of stops for a second and he says, hey, why don't you guys order something to eat? Because, you know, I'm getting hungry. I mean, this is how cold this guy was. I mean, you know, nothing bothered him. You know, Comandante got a little bit upset, you know. He goes and drags him out of the hole. And the whole time the Comandante's walking around, he's walking around with this little Uzi hanging right off him. And he grabs this Uzi and he fires in the air. He just... Fires, I think, out of fr frustration of what was going on. And he tells this kid, Serafine, he says, you don't think bullets can hurt you? He says, no. He gets his Uzi, points it right in the air, and just, just lets the whole clip go, man. And this kid's eyes open up. I mean, his eyes open up. I mean, when he heard that sound, and it freaked us all out because we, we didn't realize what was going on. You know, he went from a believer to being a disbeliever pretty quick. He went back to being a normal person. Right away, he started saying, well, you know, I don't know why they got us to do this and do that. You know, all of a sudden, he, it, it, it's why they got us to do this. And, it just changed. He just changed.
Entonces, ¿cómo es que le daban de comer, güey? Los ojos de andar, pero con seis, los ojos que le, que le dan de comer en la boca. Cuando llegamos y le dimos de comer y agua, ¿qué tal? 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 We got a lot of bodies out here. We're going to be out here a long time. I could hear a tractor working close by. I said, why don't we get that tractor and bring it out here? So we got the tractor and we started getting the bodies out. And I told the Comandante, Comandante, we've arrested the other people. We got how many more in jail? He says, four more. I said, why don't we bring them out there and get them to dig? Maybe there's more bodies that this guy doesn't know. So they got the rest of the people out there. ¿Cómo te llamas tú? Sergio. ¿Sergio qué? Martínez. ¿Tú lo levantaste? Yo lo manejando y lo había hecho. They all had uh, badges that said state police. They all had jackets that said police on them. They had red lights in their car. They, they ran around Matamoros like if they were, they were police officers. ¿Y quién fue que lo levantó la primera vez de ahí donde estaba parado? Yo y Malio. ¿Tú y quién? Yo y Malio. When John straight off to go use the bathroom, that was the perfect time. They went up to him, they badged him, they put him in a car, they told him he was under arrest for being drunk. They drive down about two blocks, they pull over, they all get off, the policemen, the, the, the guys acting as policemen, to wait for the other car to show up. John jumps out and starts running. John being the well-educated boy that he is, and was brought up to respect the law, when he heard the word freeze, he stopped. He was half a block from getting down to the main drag where there was 2,000 kids party. And he stopped, they handcuffed him, they threw him back in the car, they took him to the ranch, they tied him up, and they put him in the back of the suburban. ¿Quién le pegó con el machete? ¿Tú? ¿Él le pegó con el machete? ¿Quién le pegó con el machete? Padrino. 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 I think the hardest thing was, for me, was coming back from the ranch that afternoon. And I was the one that had to tell John's parents what had happened to their son. We got a, an organization which is moving narcotics, thousands and pounds of marijuana. The same organization is involved in a religious cult, and we don't know how many members. You know, we don't know how big this is. Here we are in Matamoros in a ranch with 23 bodies. You know, how many more bodies are there in Mexico? There's a lot of questions that are going to have to be answered. It's not going to stop right here at this ranch when we dig these bodies out. A lot of people that are in the narcotic business practice some kind of either santeria or brujeria for protection. We started thinking it was santeria. We started saying it was santeria that they were practicing. Because talking to these guys, they, they, they started saying, yeah, it's santeria. We find out while we're doing this investigation that it's Palo, Palo Mayombe in that Santeria. By then we knew that it was Constanzo that was the head of the organization. And back home in Mexico City, Constanzo was a Palo Mayombe priest and he would do cleanses. There's the belief that if you're involved in narcotics, that you get strength from these cleanses. And he would charge anywhere from $1,000 to $2,000 for each cleansing that he did. Not just to narcotic people in Mexico City. He did it to politicians, movie stars, lawyers, doctors. Because we eventually found his book with the recipes for each one. So he had a good business. He had a nice home in a nice area in Mexico City. Constanzo 
comes from a family that had practiced Santeria all their lives, but he went a step further and started practicing Palo. In Palo, they have an inganga being a, a steel pot, and you put everything into this steel pot and you worship this steel pot. So if you want to give it strength, you put stuff in there to give it strength. Uh, you know, muscles from animals. If you want to give it youth, you put the blood of a baby chicken. And this was bringing him fortune. He was doing good with this. Well, he figured if sacrificing animals was so good, if he started sacrificing humans again, because Palo, when it first started, was human sacrifices. They took Palo back to the way it was practiced before. For instance, Constanzo wanted to give the Nganga youth. Well, he sent these guys out to get a little boy, and they got a little boy. And they started to cut his throat. And as they started to cut his throat, he started to cry and cry and cry. And he stopped, he said, no, it's no good. Because if he's crying, it's gonna make the Nganga sad. So they just killed that kid, threw him aside, told him to go get another one. They drove down the road. There was a kid on a bicycle. They got him, they brought him, and they used him just to satisfy Constanzo. And they did different things. They, they, they wanted to give it strength. They got this guy who was real strong. They used his blood and his muscles for the Inganga. And that's what happened to John. Constanzo felt that the Inganga needed a little more brains. So he told these guys, hey, it's spring break. Go to the clubs, open your ears, and see who's studying to be a doctor and get me that person. And they found out that John was a medical student. And we knew that there was a woman involved. Her name was Sara. Sara was labeled the honor student in Brownsville and the witch in Matamoros. She went to school at the college here in Brownsville. She would work part-time at the college. She played volleyball. She got along with everybody. She would cross that border to Mexico and she would become somebody else. Sara started dating Constanzo until she found out he was gay. She said, no problem. But then he told her that what he was involved with, and she introduced him to the Hernandezes. So it was Sara. Sara was the one that connected all these people together. Constanzo was getting these people, and he was making them believers. I think it can happen to anybody. Most of these kids came from good families, and they were already involved in moving narcotics. So I think it was easy to graduate into the cult part of it because they saw the wealth and they saw the power that Constanzo had. A lot of people might say, were they really believers? Or they were just doing it because they were having the money, they were had the good cars, they had the women. I guarantee you that these guys were really involved because you're not gonna sit there and do a human sacrifice one after another if you really didn't believe. At one point, you would have to walk away from it. The Comandante took brujería and all this very, very seriously. In fact, he flew in his own brujo to take care of him and take care of all of his agents to make sure that there was not bad vibes. And not only that, but to help him in the investigation to find out what was the best way to catch Constanzo. He told Benitez, you want to catch them? Burn their hut. Burn their inganga. Burn where they were worshiping. So we got out there one Sunday morning. He took one Mexican television station to cover it because he wanted Constanzo to see this. The brujo puts gasoline around it. They light it up, and it starts to burn. And he sits there while the whole thing burns to the ground. I come home that night, and I saw it on the news, and about midnight, I get a call from Mexico City that they knew where Constanzo was. What had happened? 
Constanzo saw the burning of the temple of the hut, and he felt raped. He felt that we had invaded his privacy, that we had done something we shouldn't have, and he started losing it. And, and Sara told us, Sara was the one that told us this. We turned on the stove, put the money on the stove, started burning money, uh, and he started throwing coins out, just lost it. The police showed up, and he dies. The police arrest the rest of them. Sara, Constanzo, of course, goes to the morgue. The police told us that Constanzo had died because he had ordered his boyfriend to shoot him and kill him, and that he shot him and killed him, and then he committed suicide, which was a believable story. But I went to the autopsy in Mexico City, and he had about 20 or 30 bullets in him. Somebody's going to kill you and then kill yourself with suicide, but it's going to be maybe one or two bullets, and, and that's it. But when, you know, you got this many bullets in you, I think he, he might have been shot a few times before by the police. Regardless if, if he shot himself at the end or not, you know, I think he, he did have a shootout with the police. and The police were scared of him. Again, we go back to the Brugadillas there. They take that stuff serious in Mexico. They take it very serious. Uh, they, the, uh, and, I, and, and I think they were scared of him. He was involved with so many politicians and state police and federal police and different people that we found in this book that I'm sure the word was out. You find this guy, you kill him because we don't want this guy to talk. We found a total of 23 bodies in the Matamoros area. There was another 40 something bodies that were found in Mexico City. According to the police, they connected all of them to Constanzo. I don't think that anybody had ever done this before, especially for human sacrifices. This guy was just out of control. And I guess all this takes us back to that young kid that I saw standing there when I walked into that office, said, if he had done this, Constanzo had done his job so good that he, he had this kid convinced that the federal police or state police or any police could do anything to him, that he ran that roadblock. And because of his belief, brought the whole organization down. We're in a war in Iraq. We're spending billions of dollars. You know, we're, we sit there and we say, we shouldn't be there, we should be there. Who cares? But if we could spend that money for one year, on our borders and in Mexico and in Colombia, we would take care of this drug problem. And taking care of this drug problem would make all this area peaceful again because what's causing the whole problem in the United States and in Mexico and in Colombia is drugs and nothing else.